this wavy thing and I did I didn't like it but you know I didn't know what to do and it just sort of it let me know one time hey we'll go backwards how about that and I said okay good and then and then you and parting parted ways well, that's it exactly exactly sweet post parting is what we call it post are you having post parting depression <laughs> no I'm not actually it, it was no no good it was a brightening of your world <laughs> I like it yeah yeah uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, I think we'll get a couple more people in, but we might as well start. Uh, today is a check-in format. Um, so all of you know the protocol of being deeply experienced OGMers at this point. Uh, so I will step aside. Uh, we may have may have a, a newbie guest who wrote me and said I might be able to join you. Uh, I've explained the protocol to him, so I think uh, I think his name is Alex, and if he shows up, that's great. But he said he might be a little late to this call. Um, because he had something else that conflicted, but he's going to try. Anyway, um, I will mute myself and whoever would like to step in and start the dance. Well, I'm never shy. Um, greetings from Arlington, Virginia. I have returned after a marvelous three-week vacation with my daughter and my wife. Two weeks in Sweden, introducing my daughter to some of her third cousins. We had about six smorgasbords and got to meet 30 different relatives, and I gained at least six pounds. <laughs> um, it was also beautiful weather, and we just... Oh, got to see some great places um Hi. if if you're going to sweden make sure you make a special trip to gotland it's one of the oldest settled parts of sweden it's an island off the coast about two hours by ferry and there's a medieval town called visby uh, we took the most glorious bike ride of our lives and uh, just really enjoyed the culture and it's also peak flower season so it was just just marvelous and then we mm. stopped in iceland on the way home for five days and i i hope all of you have a chance at some point to go to iceland we headed off to the most obscure parts of it um places where you had to go on dirt roads to get anywhere um went snowmobiling on a glacier ate fermented shark yeah um but yeah the history the strange stories the sagas it, it all comes to a really interesting um combination and uh we just we just loved it and it was nice to come back to uh to rational weather um while we were gone we made a point of not telling our washington dc based friends how nice it was because they were suffering through terrible humidity and heat uh, last few days here have been just glorious, so uh, that's good news. But um, I'm I'm in this weird place now where I have to get back to focusing on work and taking care of the mundane things that come with home ownership and and all the social things that I'm involved in. One thing I'm very involved in right now is the Arthur C. Clarke Foundation. Uh, we've been out, been around for almost 35 years. We perpetuate the memory of Arthur C. Clarke, not just his science fiction writing, but also his engineering. <clears throat> he was the guy who dreamed up the idea of a geosynchronous satellite orbiting over the same point on Earth um, and providing a, a reflection point <clears throat> for telecom signals. And so we honor impressive feats of engineering and impressive feats of imagination that have shaped our future. Uh, this year, one of the people we're honoring is Nicholas Negroponte, who the older people on this call probably know or know of. Um, he was one of the first five internet gurus back in the 80s, along with Jerry and Esther Dyson. Esther was given our uh, award for innovation about three years ago. 
and uh, we're honoring Nicholas uh, this time. Um, we have a large, we have a, a gala dinner in Washington in November. <clears throat> um, if you're interested, uh, let me know. We'll also webcast it. Uh, and we have some pretty interesting interviews with former awardees of uh, the foundation. But right now I'm working hard on something I do very poorly, which is trying to find sponsors for things like this. So if any of you have advice on how to get people to who have lots of money or who are very altruistic to write a check, uh, let me know. It's uh, This is a cause I obviously believe in, but everybody else goes, oh, what a good idea. I'm sure somebody would like to support this. <laughs> but our whole focus is on getting people to think 30, 40, 50 years into the future. And I, I, I do think we have a need for future thinking. It's also fun to go back and listen to some of the talks from 15 years ago by futurists who got some things really right and other things not so right. So that's where I'm at. Um, but as I say, I'm having a hard time getting inspired and going again. I am inspired a little bit by the state of U.S. politics, although um, infuriated by the incredible immorality by certain disinformation vendors on the Republican MAGA side who will just say anything. And they assume that if they say it 10 times, enough stupid people will believe them. But I, I just, I, I, I don't know how to fix that problem. I'm sorry to ramble so much. It's been a while since I've been able to do an update. So I had about a month worth of updates to give. Thank you. Um, thanks, Mike. And I'll step in just briefly. <coughs> I think Kevin was going to do the same thing that I'm doing. Isavari, thank you for joining us. It was lovely to meet, sort of e-meet you on uh, Liz Carlisle's call, uh, which I, I loved that call. Uh, Kevin was on the call as well. And um, you've stepped into a, a, our strange format. We alternate formats. Every other week, we do this check-in thing we're doing right now. And then on alternate weeks, we have a topic that we sort of choose together or I, I like suddenly comes into my head. Uh, so today is not a to uh, focused topic until we're all done checking in. So each of us will step in when we want to. Um, silence is good here. So we may pause between check-ins. It's a little bit like Quaker meeting uh, in that sense. And um, we don't use the chat during the check-in until everybody's checked in. And, and once everybody's sort of gone once, uh, you'll see me step back in. Right now, I'm just going to go mute myself and, and stay muted for, for a while. And if you don't feel like checking in, uh, just say so in the chat, or you can say, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll pass or hello, everybody. That's just fine. Uh, but it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, and Kevin, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that, or if, Isabar, if you wanted to say something. Or Stacy can. I mean, I, I'm glad to see you, you know, so. Well. All good? Yeah. Shall we go, we'll go to our format? Sure. I will mute. Well, I would like to do an update because I've, I've got a bunch of things that I, I need to talk out. Uh, I've blogged about it. I've been working with this group <clears throat> trying to work on the rights of nature, specifically on the river that uh, our farm is on and our family lives on. Um, and um, we've been working with the college that's across the river and the town of Black Mountain. Now we're doing a Swannanoa River revival. Um, and um, also that I discovered on my land and the land right across, uh, were the first settlers in Buncombe County. I bought it from the family that had owned it for 285 years. And uh, they did mm -hmm. the first massacre. And I can see if I were on the other side of the house, Jones Mountain, that is uh, on Warren Wilson, there's a trail up there. And there's a marker to where the, the a tribal band killed Samuel Davidson. They decided he was not a good guy. And so the people who lived here on our land and um, the Davidson family and the folks right across at, at, uh, at uh, 
where the Bee Tree Creek comes into the Swannanoa, which is the, the park right across, uh, went down and killed everybody. You know, they killed women and children and old people and braves, etc. And uh, so I'm looking to do a uh, memorial to that massacre on from our standpoint. And now I've got a two-spirit Cherokee uh, guy who's... Uh, kind of influential who wants to do a performance art piece at the festival uh take on uh, you know a, per, a persona he brings on and i'm also meeting tomorrow with the indigenous uh, student association leader who uh they are are interested too and so we're gonna we're gonna work on that memorial uh by the end of next month and then also you know set up a way to you know people can act as uh, in repair that you know with the memorial to the massacre goes the you know it, it, people will realize we're com we're complicit like there's a hundred people that walk on the park right every day right across from us and and they don't know that they're you know that land is is where there was a massacre launched and so we will do a, 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 a memorial here, and then we hope that they do over there. We have to talk to park people and that kind of thing. And I talked to a friend today who works with land back stuff, and you can do a community benefit agreement that when the tribe can come to, and they don't have to talk to you, and they get rights to just go to, and you set it aside, a little piece of your land, and they can come and because there there are they can connect to the spirits of the people that are their people that they can't don't have access to. So they they don't want to tell you what they want to do. They want to go there. And so we can set up a, a part of the land and then we've got a good part of the land that was also part of that village. There's been a village that the archaeologists uh, have studied, dug, whatever that was there 5000 years. Uh, that's you know 100 yards away so they're they're sure it was obviously on this side of the river too so it, it all i've been working for several years and suddenly it's all really come together in the past you know um week or so and it's pretty wild um so i'm just gonna go along with that and you know i'll tell my story i'm gonna be talking about this. so the, the little part of this is actually interesting i think the people who did the massacre were scots and they had uh, many of them had learned surveying because they'd been part of the wandering uh sheep herders clans who were displaced when all of a sudden with industrial revolution wool became really valuable so the, the folks from london came and claimed title to the land and surveyed it and and evicted them <laughs> and so they came to the u.s and uh so the, the the first um blood of the trail of tears happened near here at, in the village of saluda and they set up a whole thing the cherokee said look i we, we, you kill people with the way you are but these, these people are immune you know from smallpox they didn't know what it was but the, we will trade with you here and uh and you don't have to come up we will bring things down <clears throat> and they thought they had an agreement and so the head man poured out dirt in front of himself and in front of the colonel and he, he said this land is our land is your land meaning we share this land right we are all relations so it was a closing ceremony they taught, thought it was transfer of title and they sent in surveyors and then they started shooting Indians who didn't pay attention to land that they didn't have title to. And so those are actually the first uh, the first Indians killed in the Trail of Tears happened really near here because um, they would killed the Catawba earlier. So, you know, that was just it was the ones that were next. And so surveying is a way to conquer. And then you send in soldiers to, to you know, all you're doing is protecting property, but it wasn't property till you told them it was. And, the, and the, the, the tribe didn't like, what do you mean you own this land? I mean, we own this land together, you know, and then, anyway, so then then the Indians died, they got sent away. And the ones here hit up in the hills and didn't do the Trail of Tears. And so the Eastern Band is less willing to be in relationship than a lot of other tribes. So we'll just set anyway, but it's really exciting that they want to, they've asked me to collaborate with them on doing a memorial. And so they'll do a memorial from their point of view and I'll do it from, you know, um, I think it's, it's going to be the story will be surveying is, is, is 
we conquer by surveying. That's that's going to be my story, I think, at this point. And you, you survey because then you've set a value on it. And but before that, you've commodified folks, right? And so you've you put a price on everybody. And uh, and the highland clearance is a, is a, one of the big ways that that started to happen. Uh, so anyway, and those people came here and then killed and committed a massacre. So there you go. <laughs> I'll jump in there behind Kevin. Um, I don't have that much in my own uh, that comes to mind that, that would be of interest <laughs> to share with this group um, this morning, but um, his uh, mention of the, um, you know, indigenous people, American Indians, you know, whatever term you want to use um, over the last uh, couple of decades, I've been involved in some, watershed planning in the Walla Walla Valley that um, the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation play a, a really big role there because the entire watershed is part of their ceded lands. And I remember a day when I was leaving a meeting and one of the tribal members and I just happened to be walking out of the building at the same time and he mentioned to me that that he was headed back to the reservation and they had a big celebrate planned for treaty day and i remember at the time just being kind of like dumbstruck that like that 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 would be a big celebration for them um like just like my paradigm or whatever at the time was that 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 would not be a celebratory um you know type of an event and the way he framed it was, he said, oh, no, 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 we, we celebrate Treaty Day. It's a wonderful, you know, wonderful, positive celebration. And um, he mentioned that their celebration was of the wisdom of their ancestors to enter into a treaty as opposed to, you know, um, the fork in the road was was that or extermination. Right. And and um, anyway, uh, I've found you know, Bill and, and the others, you know, tribal members that I've met to be amazingly uh, positive, upbeat, um, joyful uh, people, you know, in spite of, you know, kind of the way everything kind of fell out there. And um, anyway, just thought that that might be worth worth sharing a pretty profound, you know, shift in in my perception and whatnot. So I have to pick up on, on, um, on the two stories we just heard. I can't remember the name of it, but it was uh, a play I saw a few years ago. Um, I have a fairly famous playwright um, in Manhattan. And it was a story of a um, the entire play took place at a municipal council meeting. And they were gearing up for their annual celebration of the town father. I can't remember what his name was, gobbledygook or something like that. But anyway, one of the council members uh, discovered that the town father who founded the town uh, was also the guy who committed genocide on all native people that lived there. And the one council member who said, no, we can't continue to do this, they threw him off the council. I mean, and it was uh, um, it was just an interesting uh, discussion back and forth about how um, people just continue with their habits and, and fail to intervene. Um, I just got back from um, Southeast Asia, so I'm still a little both jet lag and I got sick over there and had to cut my trip short. But that being said, I was in both Vietnam and Cambodia. And all I could think about as I looked around were the bombings in, the, in 1970, the carpet bombings. And all I could do was scratch my head and go, you know, my God, what did we do in the name of what? 
What did the U.S. government do in the name of what? Um, and so I think that's all I want to say. Oh, yeah, there was one more thing. Kevin, thank you for sharing that um, wonderful photo of the MAGA uh, event in, in, in Asheville. <laughs> you know, pictures say a thousand words. <laughs> what an extraordinary motley crew. Yeah, it, you know, and, and, and Trump went in 2016, he went to the 7,000 person venue, and this time he went to the 2,400 person venue. And they also made him pay ahead of time because he hasn't been paying any of the other venues. So they didn't want to, his credit wasn't good. So they said you have to pay up front. Uh, so there was a, a, a crowd, but it was one third of the size of his last crowd. So it was pretty interesting. How much of that crowd we, is we, onlookers like yourself? We need to return to check in. Mode. Oh, I don't think. Yeah, I don't think. Yeah, I don't think anybody was in that. Uh, you know, I don't know. They all had hats on in the in the video. I didn't go. Let's hold the conversation until everybody's checked in, please. You're all bumming me out. I'm going to invite Isabari to come and introduce herself because I know she's prepared to do that, right? <laughs> um, she just texted me on the chat that she had to step away for a second. To oh, do an, okay. An errand, okay, and, she, okay. and she'll be and she'll be right back, and we'll let us she's know. Back. <laughs> but um, uh, let me just say something small. Cool. So I'm here. I'm, I don't know if you guys can see me, but I'm here in the. I'm busy cooking ugali for my dad, so so I just brought you guys with me so I could listen in. But uh, I can do a short intro just to feel comfortable while I'm in this space. Uh, my name is Isavari Habukwe. I born and raised in Nairobi, Kenya, and I am a 36 year old single mother, and I I was born and raised in Nairobi, but I moved to Kilifi in 2020. And I feel like I, I always want to say that bit because uh, moving to Kilifi really changed my perspective of life and it gave me a different kind of, of a sense of purpose and a sense of belonging, you know? So yeah, Kilifi is a very huge part of my, my story. And I would love to tell you guys about that story. But in the meantime, I, I think uh, that's all I have to say. I hope that was enough to, <laughs> yeah, thank you. I'll just listen in for now. Thank you. I met Isabari through Kevin and she works in her community. She'll tell you more later. And Kalithi is something you should look for on Instagram. They're really ninjas about that. It's amazing.
really kind of maybe too simple observation, um, but it just hit me a couple of days ago, which is that the newly refreshed political situation in the U.S. coincides very nicely with Ukraine's incursion into the Kursk region of Russia, uh, which has been a, a, a military success for them at a moment when they were just busy slowly losing territory on the in the Donbass because Russia is just throwing barely trained people who have a, a survival rate of like three days uh, into the battle there just because you throw enough people in there and you destroy enough buildings and there's no place left to, to sort of take cover. So you take territory. Um, and all of a sudden there's interesting things happening in, in the Kursk region, which I, and I've been following the, the Ukraine situation. Um, uh, hey, excellent. Hi, Alex. Uh, we're, in, we're doing the check-in mode and I happen to be checking in right this second. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Excellent. Um, so I've been following the Ukraine situation since this last uh, sort of attack, since uh, Russia tried to take over the whole country. And uh, uh, it turns out my grandfather was born in a town called Chernivitz, which is southwest of Kiev. Uh, it, it was not in uh, Ukraine back then, was part of uh, Romania or something like that. But but I feel, I feel like um, I've got a, a little bit of roots there. And was about to go traveling in that region before all this crap sort of happened. But I'm, I realized that my mood shift uh, into the positive was about both of these things sort of happening at the same time and Trump and Putin both being wrong footed considerably still to this moment by these two incidents happening, which alas makes me happy. And I'm sad that that makes me happy, but that's the situation we're in in some parts of the world right now. Sorry, can I ask, are we all watching something or? Uh, sorry, Alex, I'll explain. I sent you an email trying to explain the format. Uh, we're in, right. we, we alternate formats. So this week is check-in and, uh, and uh, alternating weeks, we have a topic. Uh, and in check-in, we go quiet every now and then, which is confusing to anybody who's new to the conversation. But it's a little bit kind of like Quaker meeting where you check in if and when you want to. Uh, once everybody has checked in, we switch into conversational mode. And we try not to use the chat during check-in because normally in conversation mode, we're very busy on the chat sharing links and saying, oh yeah, what about this? So during uh, this particular phase, um, you'll see me just mute and wait until I think everybody has gone and then I'll step back in. Um, but thanks for joining us and feel free to, and you can also pass if you want to just, uh, uh, you know, step in and say so, or say so in the chat. What's your question? What does checking, what, what does, uh, checking in mean? Um, normally, it means saying uh, what's happening or what you observed uh, that has something to do with the conversations we've been having, which you've not been part of. So uh, Open Global Mind is about trying to build a collective memory and trying to figure out how, how to help humans uh, at all scales make better decisions. Um, and that's really broadly our charter, but we've ended up talking about everything, uh, climate change, uh, uh, how to fix cities, uh, all kinds of like We've been talking since the start of lockdown, so it's been a while. Um, we've covered a lot of a lot of different things. Um, I hope that gives you an idea of the. the can scope I make of an observation. Please can I make a, an observation. Can I can I talk about something? Yes. Or not? Uh, right. In fact, why don't you just jump right in? Sorry, <laughs> I'll get the hang of it. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, um, something had been at the back of my mind. I went on holiday recently to Greece, which is Rhodes, where where my parent was, my my parents were from, etc. And Rhodes is a small place in it's, it's a, the biggest island, uh, the, one of the biggest islands in Greece, but it's got a population of about 100,000 scattered along, I don't know, 60 square miles or whatever it is. Main city Rhodes has about 60,000, the rest of them are scattered around. And what I noticed this time, which I didn't notice so much in the crisis years, 2011 or whatever it was, was how many young people want to leave. And I'm there as an old person now, <laughs> trying to say to them, 
I saw the bright lights. I went and I had a good life. I've had a good life here, whatever in the UK, I'm, I'm in England. But ultimately, I think they have a better life because they've got community, they've got localization. There's so many good things that we have. I'm in London, a suburban London. I don't see my relatives. I don't see anyone. I mean, you know, let's accept it. I just sit there and do my own thing. So the, the, the point I was making in a recent meeting was uh, with some other people is that in the US, you've got more of a chance of doing that. You must have the same draw into the cities, the bright lights. But I think there's more resources in the US, which is what you guys have been talking about, to stop that drain, stop the bright lights attracting all the young people, because the young people are going to keep the places going. Um, and I think that's what you're doing. Ultimately, that's what OGM is kind of doing, uh, or a certain portion of it. And that's the thought I had. But, you know, I have no ideas how to make it happen. <laughs> uh, that sounds like a perfect check in, Alex. Thank you. Um, and at, right now, I don't think you'll hear anybody reply to you. But once we, we've all checked in, we'll probably go there. Okay. Thanks. So a few weeks ago, uh, I wanted to have a conversation about what people thought about climate change because I couldn't tell what people really think. And after that session, I'm almost as confused as I was then or uh, uninformed as to what's really going on in your minds about climate change. It seems to me it's really rough. And if we had the climate change things like uh, the flipping of the, of the poles of the earth, uh, just to pick one, or the increasing vectors of uh, diseases in the world, we're in real trouble. And it seems to me the only sane conclusion, no, I don't like that phrase, I'm gonna take that back. A conclusion is that we've got to learn to manage the world as a single system, where all the variables count. And we're not looking at so many variables uh, and just pursuing the view that if we get one thing right, the world will somehow be better. And I'm just really skeptical. Uh, when I say deal with the world as a single system, I think of a kind of engineering view where the first thing you do is kind of make notes about all the things that might be relevant and then play out the interactions. Uh, we're not doing anything like that with climate change. So I'll stop there. I don't know who's gone or not gone. Um, so I uh, I had an interesting experience yesterday that uh, sometimes happens. I had a day full of uh, meetings and uh, appointments, and uh, not one of them happened. I had a podcast booked, and the guest didn't show up, and, uh, you know, like, a bunch of other meetings and, and just for one reason or another, they didn't happen. And, and I had these sort of secondary things that were on the calendar as sort of, Oh, I wish I could make that, but I can't because I have these meetings. And so, um, and then I was able to do two, two events that um, I would normally wouldn't have gotten a chance to do because they, they were, um, uh, you know, the, the, the secondary ones. One of which was with uh, with Stacy and Kevin, um, this beautiful presentation from a, a young lady whose name I, I'm very bad with names, um, Black Farmers Fund, and um, she 
uh, presented some work around a fund helping local farmers, um, BIPOC farmers, uh, with funding. Um, and she's raised 12 million. She's got, a, she's aiming for a fund of 20 million. And, uh, and that was super encouraging because I've been kind of looking at this world of, of, um, capital and, and, fu uh, financing funds, uh, to move some of these movements forward. And, um, it's the first time I felt really encouraged by, uh, someone who's doing it right. Um, the the attitude was she, she was asked at one point how do you how, how do you think you should do one of these funds she says go spend time with them go spend time with the folks that are that you you plan to help uh be there with them understand what they need understand who they are understand where they're at and then um bring about um uh, bring about the change you want to bring about, but with with them on board, with them as as participants, not you trying to do something for them, not knowing what's going on. She herself was a farmer, um, and she had um, this really really interesting um, experience of of being able to help these folks from a place of of understanding what that, what that was. And so that, that was a, an awesome experience. And I, I look forward to learning more from that community. Um, they're in the Northeast. She's out of Boston. And, uh, and I think, I think we need a lot more of that. Um, and then, so I look forward to, to working with Kevin and Stacey and others to, to figure out how we do that on the, the community workspace and not just, not just farms. And the other uh, event that I attended um, was a researcher again, whose name I can't remember at the moment, but I'll I'll think about it. Um, Dan, you'll you probably all recognize he's the fellow who had the um, the burn scars and so forth, and has half a beard. Uh, Ariella, Ariella, just... thank you. Um, and. And he was speaking to a small group about um, how do we, you know, how do we help fix things, the conversation we seem to have regularly around here. And um, and much to, to Doug's point, but he didn't frame it as a system. He framed it as, as nature. Um, people generally don't do what we think they're going to do from a, a rational perspective. Um, they do what is um, in the moment for them, what is necessary for them, and what is going to conserve their energy in the moment. And so he played out a whole bunch of examples of, if you want change to happen, you're not going to do it by convincing anybody that that change needs to happen you need to build things that are easy for them to employ. Um, you need to find ways to make options that what he called the choice architecture, um, the, the path that is easier to take, better for them to take in the moment and um, is av available to them. And I think without really thinking about it, that's what I've been trying to do um, and not very well, but I'm, I came to the realization that, yeah, it's not about trying to convince each other here or anywhere else, but about doing the things that we can do that allows us to take the steps that are the better steps. Because if the step is available to be made, we will make it um, or take it, I should say. So um, so I was, I was kind of happy that my day fell apart at the end of the day. Uh, I had a couple of really interesting uh, conversations that I wouldn't have had had, it, had things get going as normal. So sometimes it's nice to have a uh, little accident. And, uh, so thank you.
I'll go really quickly. Um, I've been continuing to network with people on LinkedIn. I'm finding LinkedIn to be um, a better source of at least uh, a more filtered, uh, a, a, you know, less cluttered source than Twitter for news and for information, especially, you know, if you have a, if you're following people who are, you know, studying the climate change and the meta crisis and the things that we're discussing, it's a pretty good source. I, I never used it be really before the summer. Um, I, I always just assumed it was more for business as usual. And obviously there's a lot of that too. Um, and everyone's using it to connect and because we do live in a system where, you know, we obviously have to make some income. Um, but I'm finding it interesting and refreshing in, in how big the universe of, of, you know, not just academics, but activists and, and other change makers are in there. So it's, it's anyway, so that's what I've been doing lately and it's working. Uh, you know, I think whatever I'm doing, it seems to be attracting the attention of a lot of people and they're connecting. So, you know, I'm having a good time with it, setting up a lot of conversations. So it's, it's been, um, busy and fun. So I'll go for a little bit. Um, uh, one, of, one of the things I bumped into this week uh, was the thought that people don't think. Um, uh, there, there's lots of, of ways where you can kind of like observe, you know, this is, just, this is just a really stupid thing for people to be doing. And that was the way that it came out in my head. People don't think. And then it's like, well, actually, you know, I, I said that to somebody else. And they're like, well... Um, so, uh, thinking about what I was going to say on, on the call just now, I was like, you know, the, the way it works is, uh, people individually think just fine, right? Like I can make a decision about what I'm going to do today or what I'm not going to do today. And if I don't do that thing, or if I do do that thing, what's going to happen. And I can reason about my life. Um, I can reason maybe about my family's life, right. Um, or at least my part of my family's life. Um, thinking about what I was going to say today, I, the, the problem is uh, scaling people thinking is like exponentially hard. And, and I apologize. I'm, I don't, I'm not going to use that as a technical term, but kind of a, the, a, um, a, uh, a metaphorical term, at least. I, collective thinking is just a lot harder than we think. Um, and so it's really easy to say, well, I know what the solution is. We should just do blah, 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 right? We, we should fix this climate change thing. We should fix the politics thing. We should fix the, you know, and here's the ways to do it. Um, uh, it's, I, I think when we do that, what, we, what we're doing is like, we have a model of the system and this, the model is about human scale, right? You can imagine a system, but you can imagine the system about human scale. It's really difficult to imagine a system at 10x human scale or 100x human scale or 1,000 human x scale. Um, what happens is you go, well, 
it probably that thousand X scale one or a million X scale one, it probably kind of works like the two or three or five or 10 X scale. You know, I'm going to model the climate problem. I'm going to model the political problem um, as a system that's bigger than a person. And I'm going to imagine the biggest thing that I can imagine. And, and it's five or 10 X one human, right? It's not a million X one human. You just can't model all the parts of it. So this is kind of the complement of what I say a lot of times. It's like the thing that we don't realize is that we, we live in a world of hyperscale social structures, which do things that we just can't imagine. And so when I say that, I'm like, yeah, hyperscale social structure, like a religion, you know, or, or uh, capitalism or something like that. And it's like, even myself, when I think of that, I'm thinking of a golem, you know, but it's, a hundred humans high and three humans wide or something like that. I'm not really modeling what a religion does or what capitalism does, or even like a big business or a big business ecosystem like uh, Amazon versus Walmart. I, even I collapse it down to kind of human scale. So I think we have problems like imagining the scale of like even imagining how the system dynamics work um, of hyperscale social structures. Similarly, when we say, I think I know what the problem is, and I think I know what a collective action we could take to, to meet the challenge of climate, meet the challenge of poverty, meet the challenge of uh, social injustice, I think I know what we could do. When you go over to the next person and you say, hey, I know the solution to this. I, I think I know a, a big chunk of the solution to this problem. I want to take my understanding of it and make it collective. I want to have a collective understanding with you and, and then a collective understanding with her. And I need 10 people to be thinking of this all kind of the same. I need 100 people. I need 1,000 people. Just that, that curve, you know, it feels like it could be a linear growth thing. It's like an exponential growth thing. Trying to convince one person is really hard. Trying to convince two or three people is like insanely difficult. Trying to convince a hundred people to act kind of with their interest and against their interest collectively, it's like well nigh impossible, right? And so I think one of the things that we tell ourselves is, well, but it's done. Um, you know, uh, take, uh, take the Stop Tobacco Initiative that started in California. It used to be that we smoked in indoor places and now we don't. That was a collective action thing um, and it was successful. Um, take, uh, you know, take uh, a successful business, take Amazon or Microsoft or Apple. You know, it was one guy's vision and then he worked with 10 people and the, those 10 people worked with a thousand people and oh my God, Bill Gates built Microsoft or Steve Jobs built Apple. Um, I think we're doing a thing where we, we, uh, we rationalize that success as being an outcome of uh, a few individuals acting in collective action. I think that we don't realize that that success, kind of like, um, uh, kind of like the black swan guy when he says, you know, you're just backfilling the the fact that random chance made some of these things successful and some of them not successful. Um, it it wasn't preordained that Bill Gates would build Microsoft. Microsoft happened because of a whole bunch of complicated system dynamics. And you have to say that it happened because of Bill Gates and his executive team and his partners and all that. But it's actually a lot more complicated than that. So complicated that you don't understand why it was successful. And you can't replicate that success by collective action with you or your peers or your community or whatever. I, so, so maybe the, the coda to this is, I guess, um, I do know that you can take collective action with people in your community. Um, maybe it's a virtual community, maybe it's a physical community. You can collectively act with 100 people, I get that. I don't know that you can take big fancy collective action at scale, a million people, a billion people, and make it work, so. Um, so then I guess we have our friends uh, like Jordan who say, well, all we need to do is like decompose it um, fractally until you're acting locally and, and making a change globally. But I think we think it's, I, I think it's significantly harder, exponentially harder than we think to do that. Thanks.
I'll go. Let me just send this off in a chat. So this was a story that somebody on um, Brian, I think he's a member. I'm pretty sure he's a member of OGM. He had posted on Facebook. So I don't go on LinkedIn, which funny people reach out to me there sometimes. I guess I had an account from many years ago and I can't even respond to them. I like to stay on Facebook because on Facebook, I know what people are really like because I see how their friends respond to them. But anyway, this story that was posted, I guess it was from 2008, was about a teacher and he was teaching about genocide. And he went through different aspects. And what happened is years later, the students were able to predict where it would be most likely for there to be conflict. And it turned out to be Rwanda. And again, I may be confusing some of the facts, but the reason it was worthy of posting is because that teacher was Tim Walls, a vice president. And that got me back to thinking about how I've always felt about Facebook, that if you had a few teacher types posting with selected comments of let's say student-like questions and answers, and we were focused on the environment that we could actually impact our virtual world because it is a small enough connected place. Um, you know, even the fact, that, so I had um, told Isabari about the call that Ken and Dave had hosted and she had already been invited. I didn't even realize that. And it just reminded us of what small circles we're actually living in. And again, so yeah, I guess I was going to make this comment, but normally there's other people that would be more interested in this type of thing. And I didn't think anybody on today's call would necessarily be interested in, well, I mean, maybe the idea sounds interesting, but actually sitting down and having a plan where, okay, I'm going to post this. He's going to respond that way. She's going to respond that way. Then we're going to multiply it. You know, I mean, I think that that would be fun. That would be something I'd want to be a part of. And I think it could be very educational. So not something I would take the lead on, but I'm throwing it out there. Worth it to read that article though, I have to say. And the fact that it's Tim Walls, that was exciting for me. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <clears throat> um, I'm thinking about slowing down. Um, partly because we hosted this call with Liz this week on the Her Book Healing Grounds. And one of the things I, I got from this book, which is a really, it's a, it's a lovely little read. And I learned, I thought I was pretty well informed about, you know, the racism in this country, but I had no idea that after the Civil War, millions of acres of of ag land fell under cultivation by former slaves and then it was all stripped from them uh through reconstruction and minstrelsy and redlining and you know i knew about the what was going on in the cities but i didn't realize they'd lost so much land and um there's a wonderful line in the book that towards the end where she she asks um she started out thinking you know okay how much carbon can be sequestered you know by land by by regenerative farming methods and she came to understand it was it was so much more than that and she asked a uh, indigenous person, you know, what is it really about? And she said, it's ancestor work. We are, you know, regenerative farming is ancestor work. It is reconnecting to the land. You cannot farm regeneratively, regeneratively unless you know that you're going to be there for several generations because it takes that long. And so I'm, I'm thinking a lot these days of how do we create a shift in attention to the longer time waves that are in the background of our lives, as opposed to the short ones that take up so much of our attention. Um, so that's that's just been on my mind this week. Of you know, uh, 
and I, I posted uh, the pace layering article that Stuart Brand wrote years ago of how different systems flow at different time rates. And I was just thinking about all these different time streams and we tend to get caught up in what's immediate. Part of that is because, you know, um, our attention spans are, are so fractured and, and uh, there's billions of dollars spent every year on how to grab our attention, um, you know, and, and how to make us think short term. Um, so I'm just really in the inquiry of, of how do we individually and collectively slow down and start to pay attention to longer time time frames, particularly because when we look at those, as Doug Carmichael so often points out, you know, climate changes relatively slowly until certain things happen and then it changes very quickly. And, you know, we have to we have to learn to attend to these things um, or we're going to be overtaken in very bad ways by them as we already are in so many ways. So that's just what's on my mind. Um, it was really a pleasure to, to host uh, Liz the other day. She's a terrific speaker, very engaging. Jerry was there. Stacy was there. Um, and I love that her book is, a, is about um, primarily about four women, uh, indigenous and, and African women who are um, really showing the way of, of how to reconnect with the land in a long-term way. Uh, so that was my big excitement for the week. Really great call, Ken. Really was. Um, Rick, I think you're the only person on the call who hasn't checked in yet. I don't know if you were aware of that or if you were thinking of checking in, but just in case you don't know that, I thought I'd mention it. Yeah, thank you, Jerry. Usually I can't make this because I'm at work. Unfortunately, it's been not too busy. I was expecting not to get until later. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to... Uh, not having heard all everyone, but uh, just heard what was Stacy was talking about using Facebook. Um, I just got kicked off Facebook. Uh, my wife has been kicked off Facebook uh, because of political things, and I'm appealing it at the moment. Um, and uh, it's just it's just interesting. I, I would never expect that to happen. It was pretty innocuous what I posted, but anyway. Uh, but I'm hearing from other people that they're getting um, disabled or cut off and they have to go through an appeal process. So, um, but the idea that I wanted to to bounce off and, and Jerry and I have already spoken about this in, a, in one of the NeoBook calls is how to use, how to connect our dots more effectively. And actually, I don't think LinkedIn is a very good place for that because it tends to be broadcasting um, content. Uh, it doesn't connect the dots very much. There's never any substantial uh, dialogue uh, on it occasionally with the big wigs you know but it's usually it's not interactive it's it's focused on the thing and I was wondering if there was some way of disrupting that and using it more concretely and using the energy of this group and um, so one idea would be uh, say if Jerry were to write a book on uh, a rather a blog post on yearbooks he shared it with the group in advance it was shared in this meeting it was posted um at the end of the meeting and that everyone agreed that they would, um, you know, having read it before, they've given some forethought and instead of having these conversations on email, uh, which is is private, that you would um, sort of crowdsource people's input such that it would help to boost um, the actual posting. So I wanted to put that idea out there as something that could be tried. Uh, and the idea behind it is if if we can be more effective co connecting the dots between people, that's where network power can arise. And how can you actually allow that to uh, flourish like mycelium networks if you can set the patterns 
and the perturbations into the uh, into the cloud, and hopefully it ricochets back on Earth with some positive impact. So I wanted to bounce that idea off the group. Um, thanks, Rick. And I think that's uh, everybody who's checked in. I just want to add that uh, what Rick just described is the NeoBooks Pops idea that we are implementing in the NeoBooks calls. <clears throat> we're, we're trying to do exactly that, um, partly because of your recommendations. Um, and I want to kind of uh, let loose the hounds. Pete is doing what I'm about to recommend we do, which is if you have notes you've been taking uh, during the call, now is the time to paste them into the chat. Uh, Dan Ariely is the guy who does choice architecture, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I want to point out that there's a guy named Aaron Huey who did a TED talk, or I think a TEDx talk years ago that I'll post in the chat uh, about all the treaties that the U.S. has abrogated with Native Americans. And the, the, the litany, it's heartbreaking. It's absolutely heartbreaking. Like we said, yep, we promised to do this. And then like, yeah, not so much. And then, nope, we're going to do this. And then not so much. And just over and over and over. Uh, so the, the, the taking of assets that belonged either to ex-slaves after, uh, during Reconstruction or Native Americans during treaties and the what push westward, all of that is pretty shameful. And, and there's a side conversation we haven't had or broached here, which is uh, the right has has conducted a very effective backlash against any kind of admissions of guilt or uh, justice or whatever. Like, like five years ago, a company that was woke was an okay thing. And a lot of companies were trying to figure out how to build a voice out in public. Today, that has been stuffed back down everybody's throats really effectively. And I would, I would love to take that back. I think companies do need to be more responsible. Um, Ken, you were going to jump in, I think. As far as I know, the United States government has broken every single treaty they ever signed with the First Nations peoples. Yep. I don't think there's a single one that's been honored. And uh, that should give us all pause because if they do that with sovereign nations, what's to prevent them from doing that for, for, uh, for the rest of us? You know, like, okay, we've decided we're going to take this away from you. Tough shit. There goes your right to, to you know, controlling your body. There goes your right to whatever. So it's uh, it's a long, a long and dishonorable tradition that exists in here, and there is that very vehement faction that is vehement faction that is is constantly trying to say no, 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 just forget about that. It never happened. Don't worry about it. You know? That's uh, just to reinforce something is um, what you just said, uh, Ken, is that. I follow the news a lot, uh, not the official news, the unofficial news. So I listen to what China says, Russia says, third world says. And the one complaint is that, what you just said, which is the US never sticks to any treaty. Anything they agree, verbal or non-verbal. It came to peak a few months ago when uh, President Biden went to China, I think it's the end of last year, and he promised something. And then I think Blinken or Sullivan or someone said something the opposite. And they literally said, how can Biden come and tell us this? And then the rest of the US doesn't do it, go against it. So it is a, it is a, an issue that, that has to be taken into account. I think it's cultural. I honestly think it's so into the culture. And I'm not saying it's the US only. I think it's an imperial thing. I think Britain, same thing. Britain is, is notorious for that sort of thing. And I think every powerful nation ends up being like that. How you change it is the challenge. Thanks, Alex. Um, I think this is called integrity among people, like living up to your promises or something like that. So um, integrity, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Stacey. Integrity um, kind of ties into a remark I wanted to make about what Rick said um, in, in a more generic sense, because clearly I trust everybody in OGM and I have a relationship. Um, but one, one of the reasons that I've been successful on Facebook in terms of building up real relationships is I've never shared anything or liked anything or done anything because people asked me to do it if I didn't really believe in it which sounds like a silly thing, 
but it's kind of hard to do when somebody asks you to share something and you're like, I'm sorry, I can't do that. It's not as easy as it seems, but it's very important, at least for me, it spoke to my integrity because what happens is things become a popularity contest and it becomes about power and status and on the call that we were on, that Jose spoke about, one of the things that Kevin noticed right away when he was listening to Olivia speak is that what her fund was very, very careful about doing was watching at every angle where the power dynamics would be controlled for to not replicate the way things have always been done. So I just wanted to throw that out since we're talking about integrity. I love that level of awareness, Stacey. Thanks for describing that. Thank you. Uh, Jose, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I, I'm going to be a bit contradictory again. Um, I think we, we're we pretty hard on governments. Um, not that I'm a fan of governments, but... Um, it was okay to write a treaty when we didn't think we were, we were going to go there, right? Because we didn't have trains and we didn't have the population and we didn't have the means and the wherewithal and everything. And then, you know, a few decades later, hey, we do have all these things and we, we want that land. So let's go do that. I think the reality is that if things never changed, if everybody just said whatever agreement you make at some point is going to be held forever um, agreements of this type of this scale right um nobody would have ever left anywhere right the world the whole of the world has been a process of moving away from where you're at and taking over another spot that maybe wasn't populated by people, but certainly populated by animals, populated by by plants. And, you know, we were nice to them at first. And then it was like, well, I'm hungry, so screw you. And um, and and there it goes. And I think thinking about life as a system and less about this conceptual idea that, that there is such a thing as... Um, freezing time and that whatever we think today is going to be pulled into the future. I, I don't think that's just reality. And it would be nice if people didn't even make those commitments and just treated each other properly. Um, but unfortunately we have, we know that we do this with our laws, Yes, you can have abortion. No, you can't have abortions. Yes, you can do this. No, you can't do that. And we think, oh, well, why did they go back on their thing? Well, because these are ideas and ideas change. And ideas um, are moments in time and they do change because we change and the environment changes and everything changes. It's not good or bad, I don't think. It's just the reality of whatever the circumstances are. And if if there's enough people who think that um, we shouldn't do abortions, then we'll stop doing abortions. And that may sound like a really bad idea, but it may sound like a really good idea to a lot of people. And so I, I wonder if our, our beating ourselves up as a nation is really unwarranted uh, when in reality, any decisions that we make as a nation to enter into treaties or whatever else are momentary. We just don't think of them as momentary. I'll stop there. Good, it's a good point. Very good point. Um, the only nuance I would have on that is when you're talking at the level of a one-way street where the powerful, I'm using lazy language, the powerful nation does as it wants, the powerful block does what it wants. We don't want abortions, that's it, end of. The problem is in this day and age, the way our civilization is, our social media, our knowledge, the news, whatever, there's always another party. 
and we tell the other party they cannot do what we want to do. That's where the, the, the issue happens. I totally agree with that, Alex. But then that means that we shouldn't be doing that in the first place. It's not that the fact that we did it and didn't hold up to it. It's just the recognition that we shouldn't have done it in the first place. Yeah, but once it's done, it's done. I accept that. It's when we move forward and we say, we can do that, but you cannot do that. We can break a treaty, but you cannot break a, your treaty with us. It's it's the, sorry, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's not a, you know, it's just the way things are, really. So. I, I think treaties only exist in moments where there's intense conflict and conflicting interests. And the treaty is an attempt to draw a line and say, we both agree to do this or not, or not do that. And power relationships are sort of the reality of the world over time. And so the treaties get broken as the power changes or as people need to do something. I, it's unlikely to be viable or useful to say, oh, we're going to do a treaty and it's only applicable for two years uh, because we know it's going to be broken afterwards. So the intentions often, the intentions sometimes are just to diffuse the situation so we can get better advantage later, which is really dishonest. But sometimes the intentions are just to put a stop to things that are happening uh, for for the moment and try to try to stop things, you know, keep things from, from going. Go ahead, Alex. I can give an example of that when Britain signed a treaty with Europe over Brexit because it was destroying Britain, really. That's exactly what they did. They put some words in the tr in the thing whereby, uh, and the UK said at the time, it doesn't mean what you think. We're going to break the treaty. Literally, they said it. Or to the press in Britain, the Europeans never heard it. To the press in Britain, they said, it's not worth a purpose right now because there's a little escape clause. And the escape clause is just a matter of definition of the clause. It's not actually... What you can read it two ways, and they literally did exactly what you said, Jerry. Sorry, no, don't be sorry, that was good. Um, go ahead, Pete. Um, thanks, Jose. Um, uh, stuff happens, I get that. Um, power structures change, I get that. I, th I think an another thing that maybe we didn't say into the room is a treaty is a way of of papering over a bad thing by it, it's a way of rationalizing you know well you know uh, so we'll take all you know uh, dear mr M ms and mr uh, indians and, and all your kids we're going to take your land uh, in perpetuity and give you you know this other crappy land or give you you know some millions of dollars it making a treaty around that is a way for everybody else to go look we did the totally fair thing we we made a deal you know and they agreed to it <laughs> they agreed to it um and you know they got some you know like uh you know valuable concessions etc cetera, etc cetera. and then for like a long time after that the general belief by the population of the u.s is well there was a deal and we did our part you know and i don't know why they're complaining i think that's bullshit you know like saying i like rick said you know might is right <laughs> is not the way to do it and having a treaty that said well it was right at the time you know for the time doesn't absolve you know, it, it, it leaves a, a, a mark in history that expands from that point of injustice and unfairness and things like that, that we continue to paper over by saying, well, but we made an agreement. So I, it's that, you know, I, I think it's really dangerous. So a, another way to, um, you know, a, a treaty is a way, Jerry, to, you, you were saying it's kind of a way to like heal a, a conflict in, in action. But, and, and maybe, and Jose, you said something like, well, we shouldn't do that. The opposite of that is like, when we do that, what happens? You know, when somebody in the past made this deal with the devil and said, well, now there's a deal, what happens after that? How do we heal those breaches? You know, do we heal those breaches? What, what's the consequence of those things? Um, and, and how many generations are people going to be paying for it on both sides? Um. It's funny because we we seem to have come to the place of like, well, treaties are crap. Let's not do treaties or something like that is what I'm hearing in the room. And I'm, I'm going to point out one of my least favorite treaties. At least it has a name of treaties, which is the Treaty of Tordesillas, which one of the Borgia popes basically did within, uh, after an edict that 
the treaty was between Spain and Brazil about who they could colonize. And uh, effectively, it gave uh, either country full dominion over anybody it found if they didn't know the name of Jesus Christ. Hmm. And uh, that was basically the, like the green, the green light, the go-ahead signal to go conquer the, as much of the world as they could and bring the treasure back to Seville or Porto or whatever. Um, and it was craziness. It was just like complete lunacy to do. It's the reason Brazil is Portuguese and the rest of South America speaks Spanish. It's that the line kind of, you know, cut, cut Brazil uh, mostly onto the right-hand side, which was the Portuguese side of, of that particular line. It's, it's just nuts. Um, but I will say that treaties are, are an attempt to pin down in writing with agreements and some ceremony, some state of affairs, and that there have been some useful treaties somewhere along the way. I mean, uh, nuclear arms treaties, like them or hate them, reduced a whole bunch of nuclear weapons. They were like, like the salt talks um, actually had a lot of nuclear arms destroyed and, and, and taken out of, uh, you know, out of the system. That's interesting. And I'm sure there's other functional treaties out there, but I'm, I'm wondering where we go with this. I wasn't necessarily bad mouthing treaties as a whole. I was just suggesting that a treaty or any other form of fixed decision making that predicts the future is is going to be wrong. Whether it's good intentioned or bad intentioned, that's a different question. But it's just going to be wrong. And if we if we don't realize that this system keeps moving, this system is alive, then we're going to keep making the same mistakes of either making treaties or not making treaties or whatever the case may be on the basis of a rigid forever we will hold on to this thing. And, and I just don't think that life works that way. I don't think that life allows us to just decide something today and that will be true tomorrow. The treaties are too rigid. The structure they, they imply or, or rely on is too rigid for how we're, the world actually works, I think is what you're saying. That's what I'm saying. Thank you for being good at saying things. Hmm. <laughs> Ramsey, please. So treaties are contracts. Um that nations made whatever, but it's like me, I, if I buy my house <clears throat> and then society grows and turns out that the community is like, you know, we need, we need to build a mall there because now we have our populations bigger. So we're going to take your house and that would be fine. Uh, Jose, there would be no problem with that as long as it's fair and I get compensated and there's, you know, there's c continuing agreement and a renegotiation, but there was no renegotiation between America with its uh, treaties with the natives, right? We didn't compensate them. We just broke our, uh, our treaty completely. So there, that you can't have a society where one party can just, you know, decide what they want to do and break their promises. It, it's just not tenable. Uh, there is no excuse for it, period. Uh, I, uh, so if there were cases where America did compensate them fairly in, in, in negotiations, then great. Uh, you know, I'm not a historian. I don't, I don't know about any of that. But, but my sense is that we didn't. Um, so, But I suspect no, no country has. And I'll, I'll no, stop there because I, I, like I don't want to really... Also to make a quick comment um, to, but, uh, to Alex's point about um, the Greeks wanting to leave. You know, I was born in North Macedonia, and it's the same thing over there. It's the same thing in a lot of the, the world. It's a brain drain, right? They they educate these kids to the best of their abilities, and that even that isn't that great. Uh, and then they leave, and they go to other countries who can steal them and pay them more money, uh, and then they employ them as doctors, as educators, and, and, and engineers, scientists, et cetera. So they're taking uh, their capital of these countries. And so they can't have viable... Um, um, competitive markets anymore. And so it's terrible. We're, we're destroying them, their ability, because we're taking their best people. And so where, where is their future going to be built? You know, uh, it, where's it going to come from? They don't have the infrastructure. They don't have the people anymore. And so it's, a, it's not good. And this is why they want to leave. It's a combination of, of a lack of access to, you know, the training and the information and in the, in the, in the capital that they need um, and of course, the, the opportunities for income, the, the, there is no, there aren't enough jobs. There's not enough uh, the, of the, this kind of work that they could do, you know, even 
uh, labor. There isn't even um, physical jobs uh, available to a lot of these countries because there's so many more uh, other countries that are even more impoverished and willing to work for less. And so the labor goes to where it's cheapest. Anyway, it's a, not a good situation. Thanks, Ramsey. Um, anyone else on any other topic that came up? Rick, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to um, share something my wife shared me from Facebook when she wasn't banned, but I was. But I was able to watch it on her computer. And it speaks to the issue of integrity. And while we don't have time to go into this, this is worthy of a conversation some other time. And that is the distinction between the language of values and virtues. And we don't make the distinction very well. But this particular video is by far the best Christian pastor that I've ever heard speaking about the moral hypocrisy of uh, Christian nationalism. It is an astounding tour de force uh, and talking about the original um, word of Jesus. It, it, it's a must watch. So, and if only we could co-elevate things like that, opposed to, you know, if the, if, if the algorithms were designed in such a way that there are reputational scores automatically uh, put onto people's um, Facebook accounts where it's clearly and unequivocally false uh, and you would have a reputational score which would downregulate all the disinformation and conversely co-elevate this person it would make a big difference and I'll just share a brief example somebody did something on my Facebook page and it was it was a beautiful diatribe complete utter rubbish I didn't have the time to go and refute all the facts. I just took it and put it in AI. And it said, can you refute anything that's incorrect there? It came back with a brilliant response, which I wasn't going to spend my time editing because it was good enough to refute somebody who was spreading disinformation. So as long as the, you know, the, the system is designed in such a way for eyeballs, attention, fear, hate, rage, and that's what makes the money, then we're going to go down into the cesspool. So we have a choice. Do we want to go into the cesspool or do we want to have co-elevation until the systems are designed in such a way that we marginalize people like Trump and others, then we're going to be locked into this, uh, this forever land of um, power abuse dynamics. So anyway... Do look at it. It is brilliant. And 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 add your comments to it because this guy just is so incredibly candid and sharp in his articulation about the moral hypocrisy of Christianity. And it's best coming from somebody from your own tribe. Love that. Thanks for sharing that, Rick. Um, go ahead, Alex. Do we have time? I'm happy to. We're uh, six minutes away from the end of our call, so yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Um, strange enough, I, I was designing something about a year ago along those lines, but I got caught up with AI, which was part of it, but um, so I got sidetracked to other projects. So I haven't proceeded on that basis, but I'll pick it up again one day if nobody else does. What I want to come back was the subject of in integrity and treaties. Now my background, in case it's not obvious, maybe it is, it is, it is obvious, I don't know. I'm Greek descent. I, I was born Greek parents. I was born in Africa, lived in Africa for most of my life. Then I moved to, so I've lived a very short time in Greece, although I go on holidays three or four times a year. Um, and I live in the UK. So I have come to pick up or see how different cultures exist. And I have no problem, you know, having two things in my brain both of which are wrong or right, but both of which are, I just have that sort of capability, which I notice a lot of people say that live in Britain only see things one way, the cultural way they came up with. So the one thing I just wanted to mention quickly was on the issue of treaties, I think it happened a lot since the hundreds of years ago up to until about the year, probably 2010, which is in the Western culture, what you write in a contract, i.e. a treaty or a contract, is the law is what. You can say anything you like. You can talk to the other party and talk about this and that and the, the other and promise them anything you like. And then you put out the contract and they must actually read it to the same level, level of 
accuracy and knowledge to make sure there's nothing there that will be wrong. But how it's seen by the other side, so the, the Western nations will go, that's their approach. The other side will say, but we agreed, you shook my hand. You said what you, we agreed on that. The fact that the paperwork says something not quite what you promised, either by intent or by, you know, writing it the right way to give you a bit of freedom from the Western side. I think that's a, a fundamental difference in culture, which really surprises me because when I see, for example, a lot of uh, New York police cop dramas, especially of a certain era, they keep going, oh, you owe me one, whatever, you owe me one, you know, so, so people at a local level will owe each other favors. And I think it's an, an American cultural thing. I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't exist in my, in my life. But it's just that I think it's important to recognize there are different cultures now coming together, completely different cultures. Our Western culture has progressed a lot further than what is coming up now, and they're just learning the ropes. I'm not saying it's, I think it's good, but I, it's just something to think about that there's a lot of, you know, when you, when you listen to different, say, Russian politicians versus, uh, American politicians, the Russians say, but you promised not that NATO wouldn't expand of that talk in that conference, in that thing. The president said this, the vice president said that. And the Americans say, well, it was never written down, so what the hell? That is that is quite quite a thing to take into account in historical terms. I don't think it'll happen from now on. I think from now on, everybody's learned the lesson and they're going to proceed along those lines. So I don't you, mean, know. you mean all bets are off on it and everybody's going to just uh, wander off or what do you mean? No, I think they'll be more careful what they sign. I think that they won't believe people's words. They'll just make sure the documents, the treaties are a lot more watertight from both sides as far as they can be. Because, look, you can't write them forever. The treaties cannot be valid forever. So, but I think I think the process you've described is is omnipresent through um, human history. I think that people have oh, always yeah. tried to make and then broken agreements. I think power, uh, the power dynamic is a global problem and issue and ever present thing. Uh, and one of our big problems is that the, the cultures around the world that were pacifist and knew how to govern each other succumbed to the violent cultures that had better weapons. That just happened over and over again. I mean, I, I was reading a description. I grew up in Lima, Peru. And I was reading a description of Pizarro. Uh, who uh, basically learned his lesson from uh, Cortez going into uh, Mexico with 300 soldiers and conquering the Mesoamerican, uh, you know, empire. And Pizarro was like, oh, yeah, we can do that. And basically, you know, took a page from, from Cortez's book and, and did it to South America with 170 troops or something silly like that. I'm like, wow. Uh, you know, that, that, that's, that's sort of lots of history. Um, Stacey. Yeah, well, I can only speak to our legal system here, but our whole legal system is all about technicalities. It's not about doing what's fair or just. It's about, you know, well, here's the technicality here. So I, I kind of agree. There's no integrity. <laughs> so we've opened up a whole bunch of a series of cans of worms here, which uh, we don't have time to go into right now. <clears throat> I want to put two more things in the two more cans in the conversation. One of them is positive. The other one, not so much. Uh, but a lot of the movements that are happening right now happen to do have to do with land back, uh, which is trying to give land back to indigenous peoples in different places, uh, notably uh, Native Americans and all that, which I really like. I think the idea of land being pristine and not having any humans on it is kind of ridiculous. We should put people who know how to manage land on the land. And hey, uh, they're good for it. And then a totally separate thing that's more negative, uh, a conservative friend I have uh, talks a lot about performative progressives. And I, I'm, I'm one of the things this conversation here highlighted for me or foregrounded for me was the very effective backlash on the right on a whole variety of issues, which the left didn't fight back on. Uh, the, the, the left is just not very good in the elevator with a knife. Um, and and that, the problem is that that's the battle uh, in media and everything else. And we, we've talked a whole bunch about how crazy uh, social media can be and, and the the popularity contest that Stacey pointed to and a variety of other things. But I think that there's a whole lot of things out there that we need to get a better grasp on. 
and uh, understand and, and do more stuff about. Anyway, that's a little vague, but but all those things are, are high for me and happy to build calls in the future around those topics. If anybody wants to craft a topic description that we can go with, uh, send it to me, send it to the list, the OGM list. And uh, next week is a topic call. Go ahead, Stacey. Yeah, one other nice thing, we have that nice conviction in Arizona that le lends to being accountable for the uh, phony electorate. She's now facing 22 years. So maybe if people start seeing what could actually happen to them, instead of watching somebody like Trump keep skating by, maybe our election you know, has a chance. Uh, I mean, I'm sure there's still gonna be lots of court battles, but if you hadn't heard, <laughs> we got a conviction there. Thanks, Stacey. Um, we're pretty much at the end of our call. I, 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 Alex and Isavari, I want to thank you for being here and welcome you back anytime you want to join us. You're, it's been really lovely to, to be with you and thanks for adapting to our funny uh, check-in format. Um, and Ken often has a poem for us at the end of our calls and I'm wondering if he has one for us today. As a matter of fact. <laughs> funny thing. Funny thing. <clears throat> this is from Maya Angelou called America. The gold of her promise has never been mined. Her borders of justice, not clearly defined. Her crops of abundance, the fruit and the grain, have not fed the hungry nor eased that deep pain. Her proud declarations are leaves on the wind. Her southern exposure, black death, did befriend. Discover this country, dead centuries cry. Erect noble tablets where none can decry. She kills her bright future and rapes for a sou, then entraps her children with legends untrue. I beg you, discover this country. Very good. Thanks, Ken. That's up there with Langston Hughes and et cetera, et cetera. It's beautiful. I enjoy Yeah. And I didn't know about this poem whatsoever. Thank you. I'll post it to the list. Awesome. Uh, everybody, thank you from the bottom of my heart, of my pithy little heart, and um, send suggestions for topics into the list or on the Mattermost or wherever you'd like, but, but uh, float what you want us to talk about, and I will take that and make it happen. Bye, guys. Thanks. Bye. Bye.